Think about the last time you bought concert tickets online, which I know was probably before the pandemic. After refreshing the page over and over, you finally have two tickets and three minutes to get them. Seats chosen, credit card entered, and then bam, you're stopped by a demand. Are you a robot? No? Prove it. To do so, you might have to retype a series of blurry numbers or pick out photos of traffic lights in different road conditions. These internet security tests are known as CAPTCHAs. The average person takes only 10 seconds to solve one. But if you put all those seconds together, humanity spends the equivalent of 500 years of labor on CAPTCHAs every day. CAPTCHAs do serve an important function online. They differentiate human web users from malicious bots trying to hack or spam websites. But by proving to a machine that we're human, we're also teaching machines to see the world as humans do. And the machines are getting really good at it. This is The Court's Obsession, a podcast that explores the fascinating backstories behind everyday ideas and what they tell us about the global economy. I'm your host, Kira Bindram. Today, the history of the CAPTCHA and what happens when the tools we use to tell humans and machines apart start to become obsolete. Today, I'm joined by Nico Rivero, who covers technology for courts. Nico is our foremost expert on CAPTCHAs. He recently wrote an article about why they're so beloved by AI developers. Now, to verify Nico, I did ask him to identify six photos of traffic lights before we started, but he passed. So welcome, Nico. Thank you for joining. Congratulations on on being human. Thank you very much. So let's start with some basics. Break down the name CAPTCHA for me. What does that actually stand for? Okay, so CAPTCHA is this kind of tortured acronym that stands for Completely Automated Public Turing Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. So it's it's kind of a mouthful. But uh, we can break that into two pieces, make it a little easier to digest. There's the CAP part and there's the CH part. So we can start with the second half, CH, Turing Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. So the idea of a Turing test goes back to this British computer scientist, Alan Turing, uh, who in 1950 predicted that computers and artificial intelligence would be so advanced one day that you could be sitting in a room having two separate conversations, one with a real live human and one with a chatbot, and you wouldn't be able to tell which was which. So the whole idea of a Turing test is some kind of challenge that you'd be able to differentiate between the human and the computer. And then the first half, CAP, is completely automated public Turing test. It adds a whole other layer of weirdness to this, right? Because if we're automating it, it means that a computer is now being the judge of whether you're a human or a machine, which is how we wound up in this weird situation we find ourselves in as we move around the internet, where we constantly have to prove our humanity to a computer. Okay. So computers or humans are constantly judging each other on whether the other <laughs> is a computer or a human. So... Why do we need to know the difference between humans and computers? So all this is rooted in this problem that we were facing in the in the early internet, sometime around the late 90s, where the internet was just full of bots. And the bots were going around and leaving all these spam comments on our message boards. They were signing up for millions and millions of Yahoo email addresses so that you couldn't get the email address that you wanted. Ultimately, they were just gunking up the internet with all this stuff that made our experience of using it more unpleasant. And also, it was pretty disruptive for our ability to do business online. You can't run an email company if the person that you're trying to attract to be a customer can't get the email address they want, or you can't run a web forum if there's no way you can enjoyably use this thing because it's just full of spam bots that are trying to direct you to to some store to buy something or more likely to some porn website or whatever. Got it. And now, while 13-year-old me would have really appreciated the stakes of not being able to get the email address I want, carry that forward for me like 20 years. Like, what are the stakes today? (laughs) Well, if you think about the internet today, a lot of A lot of what internet business is built around is curating the right kinds of content that people want to see and delivering that to you as efficiently as possible. So it's kind of a needle in a haystack problem. If you let bots run rampant, you're just making the haystack bigger and bigger and bigger and filling the internet with more crap that no one wants to look at. So the whole challenge really with the internet is, yeah, it's this big sea of information. You want to be able to deliver to your, your visitor that one specific thing they want to see, that's how you capture their attention, and that's how you monetize it for your web business. And where did the idea for a CAPTCHA originally come from? So 
you start seeing these kind of proto captcha tests in like the late '90s. Um, so I think the search engine AltaVista was the first one to actually apply it. Mm, out that's in a throwback. The wild. That brings me back. Yeah. <laughs> so they they did one of these tests with fuzzy words that you had to identify. But the origins of the phrase captcha come from this research group out of Carnegie Mellon, led by this uh, professor named Luis von Ahn, uh, who goes by the nickname Big Lou. So. Big Lou and the Carnegie Mellon crew published this paper in 2003 where they coined the phrase CAPTCHA and they define a lot of the vision for what CAPTCHAs would go on to become. Got it. Big Lou and the Carnegie Mellon crew. (laughs) Just want to make sure. And you're sure they didn't release an album of some sort. It was a paper. They should have. Disappointingly, it was a computer science paper. Well, good for history and and research, bad for music. (laughs) Um, so they described this idea of a capture. They gave us the phrase, but they also did a super important thing in this original paper where they're laying out the vision that would come to define what a capture is, where they tie it very specifically to the development of artificial intelligence. And what they say basically is when we're thinking about how we design these tests, we should build them around really hard problems in artificial intelligence for a couple of reasons. First, that's going to be really hard for machines to solve, right? But second of all, what they realize later is If you design these things around these tough AI problems, like, for example, in 2003, a really hard thing for computers was looking at a picture that had some text in it and being able to read what that text was, because the text might be at an angle, distorted in some way, whatever. Computers were super bad at this. So if you do this, eventually you'll build up a big data set of images of text and the correct answer for what that text says. And you can use that through machine learning and artificial intelligence to train these machines to do it. So you will either not solve your AI problem, in which case you have a great test for for telling humans and computers apart. Or eventually you do solve it, in which case your test is broken, but great news, you've just solved this super hard problem in computer science. Uh, So tell me, is there like an uh, aha moment for CAPTCHAs or like a ta-da, like a moment when they really pop out into the mainstream? Yeah, so the the Carnegie Mellon folks, they, they published this paper in 2003. Three years later, 2006, they launched this company, ReCAPTCHA, to start uh, selling this tool to websites in the wild. And they also partner with, their first partner is the New York Times, which at the time is doing this big project to digitize their old archives of newspapers going back to 1851. And they have this problem where the software they're using is having a lot of trouble reading a lot of the old newsprint that's been smudged, distorted, or scanned at a funny angle or something like this. And so those CAPTCHA tests in those years were using real words out of the New York Times archives and asking human internet users to identify them and give them the answers and tell them what the words were. In 2009, however, a big moment, Google buys reCAPTCHA and really turbocharges this big push to use CAPTCHAs to train all their AI algorithms that come to be at the core of their business and really put all this labor that we have to do to some use uh, to train artificial intelligence. At the time, are they being upfront about the fact that they're using CAPTCHAs to train AI, or is that something that we just know or infer? No, absolutely. They're totally open about this. And in fact, Luis Van An, Big Lou, does these interviews where he says, look, people have to do all this labor all the time to fill out these CAPTCHA tests. We should use that labor for something. We shouldn't just throw it away. So we should take the data from this and use it to advance AI. And this is like a big part of how Google markets reCAPTCHA, actually. They have these things where they're like, solve a CAPTCHA, help digitize a book, or help advance the field of AI. Okay, so we've talked about like numerals, we've talked about words. At some point, CAPTCHAs pivot into images. Tell me why. So at a certain point, AI just starts to get really good at identifying fuzzy words and fuzzy numbers. So it's time to just move on to the next challenge, which is identifying the content of images. So Google at this point, it has this image search function. It's not working as well as Google wants it to. So it says, okay, we'll use CAPTCHA data to uh, get human users to, uh, to label all these pictures and tell us, is there a dog in this picture? Is there a car in this picture? Is there a boat in this picture? And what about all the, like, street signs and storefronts and, you know, all that type stuff? At this point, Google Maps has a ton, this big archive of Street View images that have all these pictures of buildings and storefronts and apartments and homes. And they want to be able to take those images to help them calibrate super specifically where is address number 27 on this street. But in order to do that, they need a piece of software that can look at those Street View images, identify the numbers 27 on the side of the building, and say, boom, at this exact 
GPS location, that's where the building is. So that's why you start seeing CAPTCHAs that are these kind of fuzzy and distinct numbers or street signs, or they say, is this a storefront? Because they want to be able to super specifically define where a store starts and ends, um, that sort of thing. Got it. I feel like this is also the point at which, like, they get harder. <laughs> you know, like, is it a storefront? Is that a bicycle? Like, I feel like I started having a hard time knowing what was what around this period in CAPTCHA history. Well, they have to get harder because the AI is just getting better and better all the time at identifying these things. We'll be right back. Okay, so when I think about CAPTCHAs today, like the ones I'm seeing when I log into stuff now, I'm picturing traffic lights, I'm picturing crosswalks, buses, all that sorts of stuff. Is that still Google Maps training? So you would think it might be Google Maps, or you might also think, well, yeah, identifying crosswalks, pedestrians, buses, that might be useful for training the algorithms that help self-driving cars see streets or something like this. But Google and Waymo, which is the self-driving car company associated with Google, are very adamant that is not at all what is happening. Uh, Waymo says explicitly they do not use CAPTCHA data in any way, shape, or form to train their algorithms. Google actually says that it no longer uses CAPTCHA data at all for helping to train its AI. In fact, it's kind of weird. When I reached out to them about this, they, the only sentence that they would say to me on the record is, Today, reCAPTCHA data is only used for security purposes. Uh, and I pointed out that if you go to google.com slash reCAPTCHA, they had this whole website that was dedicated to all the benefits that, that CAPTCHA had and the advancement of AI that had all this stuff about how when you solve CAPTCHA tests, you're helping solve these really hard AI problems. And they, they basically said, oh, well, that's actually out of date, and we'll update that. And if you look at the website today, there is absolutely no mention <laughs> of AI anymore on, on the website. Huh. Why do you think that is? So th there's a couple of reasons that I could think of. The, the first is CAPTCHAs are starting to change fundamentally in ways that mean that they are less useful at this point for generating the kind of training data that would help them advance AI. And the second reason is, you know, Google might be thinking people might get a little creeped out maybe if they start to think about the fact that, that Google has basically been systematically exploiting all of our collective labor over the past decade or so for you know, thousands and thousands of, uh, of hours of training data for developing their algorithms. And do you think you calling them and saying, hey, are you using uh, this data for cars might have sparked some of that shift. <laughs> all I know is uh, back in May when I first asked them about this, their website was all about how CAPTCHA helps to train AI. Uh, and after I pointed that out, it, it no longer makes any mention of artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's all been scrubbed. Got it. So Google's had a fun, a fun summer, let's say, <laughs> on the CAPTCHA front. I have to say I'm not too bummed at thinking about them going away because they are kind of obnoxious. But I do want to be recognized as a human when I'm using the internet. So I'm hoping you could tell me a little bit about what comes next. Like, what's the new CAPTCHA? So, yeah. So one of the problems is that we have trained AI to the point that all our old forms of tests are kind of obsolete because machines are, are about as good at hu as humans are at solving them. So there's all these kind of weird proposals that have come up over the years of like what should come next is like the next form of CAPTCHA test. And these are all ideas about like how do you design a question that a human would be really good at answering but a computer wouldn't be. So some misguided proposals have included classifying images of people's faces by like expression, gender, and ethnicity. That would not end well. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, Veto. That was a 2012 idea. I don't think that one's aged too well. But other ones are like, we'll ask people trivia questions or pop culture questions. We'll look at their location and ask them about nursery rhymes that are popular in the area where they're browsing the internet. We can do magic eye images, maybe. A computer wouldn't be so good at solving magic eyes because you need physical eyes. So all these kind of things, you run into problems with all of them because uh, the thing is that humans are not universally good at answering these questions. Some people don't know that much about pop culture. Some people won't know the nursery rhyme from a given area. So instead of all that, the direction Google has gone in is in 2014, they launched this thing called No Captcha. And that's that little box that you see on a web page that says, I'm not a robot, and you check it, and it lets you right through. The way that thing works is it's monitoring how you behave on the web page before you check that box. So there's 
uh, a lot of human weirdness and foibles that go into how we browse the web that machines just don't have. One example uh, is the way that we move our mouse is really inefficient. Uh, machines will draw the shortest line between a point and the next thing they have to click or the navigator page without using the cursor at all. Humans do these weird arcing things. They never do the same path twice. And so you can tell pretty easily who a human is by how inefficiently they're, they're moving around the page. That is fascinating. Is there <laughs> anything else? Like I, Now I'm going to be extremely conscious of what I'm doing when I'm using a web page. Google doesn't say exactly what the other things are, but it's, they, they look at your browser cookies, like your web browsing history. If your history is you've just visited the uh, Yahoo email sign-up page 50,000 times, you might be a bot. <laughs> but if you just... Or you're just having a really bad day. <laughs> like, <laughs> Very indecisive, going maybe. On. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but all kinds of other behaviors that, that machines don't get distracted in the middle of doing something and switch to another tab and then come back. We're moving in the direction of this sort of ambient monitoring that just determines whether or not we're behaving on the internet more or less like a human would or more or less like a bot would. I'm particularly fascinated because whenever I see that I'm not a robot box, I always think that feels like a less secure thing because... If I were a robot, I would just check this box. <laughs> That's what you say, would like, say. Mm, I'm not a robot. <laughs> but it's it's the most secure. It sounds like it's the most secure thing we've got going because of all this other stuff going on behind the scenes. Right, exactly. I mean, if, if you were a hacker and you were trying to design a bot to, to fool this, you'd have to design it to start being less and less efficient and behave more and more like a human. At a certain point, you start to lose some of the efficiency that is the whole point of having a bot in the first place. Right, got it. Now... It's extremely fun to think about things that humans are good at and computers are bad at and vice versa. But I feel like there's probably bigger implications I'm not thinking about if everything we tell computers or everything we give computers that they suck at, we train them to do better and then they kill it and then they kill it and then they kill it. <laughs> what is the end game of that? Like, what are the bigger questions I should be maybe freaking out about? Well, yeah, it does bring up all these big sorts of questions about how you define humanity. And I think if you were to ask, like, what makes us all human? Your gut response would be to, to reach for these kind of soaring, beautiful answers about, you know, we're, we're human because of our capacity to introspect, to understand ourselves, to have a theory of mind and know everybody else has a deep inner life just like we do. Or you might say it's about our ability to, to create art or music or to reason and solve kind of logic things. But CAPTCHAs force us to find these things in really specific ways and come up with definitions that are so concrete that we can actually test for them. And when we do that, we realize a lot of these lofty ideas that we have about humanity, they're, they're kind of practically no good. We can't really actually say what that means in practice or test for them. And so we're left with this small and dwindling set of tasks that are like, okay, yes, every single human being can do this, and it differentiates us from machines. And, it, and it's not the really cool, beautiful things. It's like, well, when I look at this picture, I know there's a dog in it. <laughs> but I feel like, you know. Why did the philosophers get into that? Like, <laughs> I identify the dog in the picture, therefore I am. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have the benefit of a bajillion spam bots. <laughs> Sad. But I, I feel like it kind of, it's reassuring in some ways because it means that there is still something about our humanity, about like what fundamentally it means to be human that is undescribable or is inscrutable or is weird and is ours, that machines just can't grasp, that we can't even fully explain, uh, and there's some mystery left to it. That's really beautiful, Nico. Can I give you my slightly more cynical take? I feel like we could end up in a future where our ability to distinguish between humans and machines is just less and less, and it's harder and harder to do that. Or, you know, maybe there's a future where a CAPTCHA itself is like, read this piece of literature, or look at this piece of art, and tell me about it, and that's the mechanism by which we display that we're human. It's actually like my nightmare for my <laughs> Discord. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we just put the SATs into yeah. <laughs> CAPTCHAs and uh, bam. Final question for you, Nico. What is your favorite fun fact about CAPTCHAs? What is the thing that, like, I'm stuck in small talk hell and I just want to bam out there with a random fact? What would you give me? Okay, my favorite proposal for a possible future CAPTCHA is one that Amazon patented in 2017, which they call a Turing test via failure. And basically, uh, it's giving us all these logic puzzles or games that humans would be really bad at but machines would be really good at. So the whole way that you prove your humanity is by sucking at this game. 
That is so Amazon. I can't even. (laughs) How do we advance the world while also just like bringing humanity down just a little bit? (laughs) Amazing. Thanks so much for joining us, Nico. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. That's our obsession for the week. This episode was produced by Katie Jane Fernelius. Our sound engineer is George Drake. And the theme music is by Taka Yazuzawa and Alex Sukira. Special thanks to reporter Nico Rivero and editor Alex Osula, both in New York. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Tell your friends about us, especially your nerdy friends. Then head to qz.com slash obsession to sign up for Quartz's weekly obsession email and browse hundreds of interesting backstories. 